Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. And this is episode 91. We're broadcasting today from Betsy Coed, which is in the north of Wales. We're not coming from our home in Germany this time. You may also have noticed that this episode is coming out about a week later than it normally would. We've been traveling for the last four or five days from Germany to Northern Wales. We've done a few interviews along the way. We're going to tell you about that trip a little bit later in the show, but first up, we'll let you know what else you've got to look forward to in this episode. Absolutely. So we are going back to Shetland again, which we know many of you particularly enjoy. Our feature interview is with the Shetland designer, Joanna Hunter. So Joanna has a small but very successful knitwear company in Lairwick, and during the Shetland Wool Week, she opens up her design studio to the public and she teaches colour design workshops. So in our interview, we cover lots of interesting topics. She shows us how to develop mood boards and play with color and also how she experiments with patterns and colors on the computer and on the knitting machines. But what I found particularly interesting is just to see behind the scenes of how a small knitwear company actually works. I think that's unusual to see, to get to see that. So I think you're going to really enjoy that as well. And we also get to learn a lot, which is brilliant. Yep. And we're staying in Shetland for a bit of a hike and some extreme knitting around the area of Eshenes, where you're going to see some spectacular scenery and also a really interesting lighthouse. Yeah. We're then traveling around 9,000 kilometers southeast to Taiwan to meet designer Irene Lin as our guest in Knitters of the World. We're announcing the three winners of our Woodhouse Knits Cow, which yep. has come to an end. And you'll notice that Andrea is wearing her Morning Star bridal jacket. Yes. So she's going to be giving us a short tutorial on cutting and finishing the steaks for that project. So all that's coming up soon. So Under Construction is starting with me because I am super excited about my project. Like Andrew said, it's the Morning Star Bridal Jacket by Crystal Safar. And even though I'm wearing it, it's not yet quite finished. <sighs> we arrived in Wales last night and we've been on the road for four days traveling. So I just haven't had that time to finish off the last little bit. But I am wearing it and I'm pretty pleased. It is fitting me and I'm sure there's probably a few of you out there who are just as relieved as I am that it actually fits and as Andrew is. I'm relieved. Because <laughs> yeah. I've done, I've actually had to. Um, re-knit quite a few small sections of this garment just to make sure that it's fitting me right and it's looking good and as you know I've done some minor alterations or modifications on it and most of them I'm really thrilled with but one of them was a big mistake really not a good idea so I'll tell you about that but first of all I just want to summarize what I've done on this garment since the last episode so the first thing I did was to um reinforce the steaks down the front center opening and the armholes on the sewing machine and then cut them open and then the pattern says to pick up stitches along the center front openings and to knit a small section of stocking stitch which you then fold over covering up the steaks and you hand sew it down on, on the inside well I did a variation on that I did a Kate Davies technique called the Steak Sandwich. Now this is the technique that she developed herself and you can read all about it on her blog. But actually I didn't even quite follow exactly what Kate does because she ends with an I-cord bind off which would have been a little bit too heavy for this jacket. So I did a variation on the Kate Davies Steak Sandwich. And I don't think it really matters you know how you do it in the end as long as you think it's neat and it kind of fits in and it's sort of not too bulky and I, I'm really happy with how it is so I've done a quick tutorial showing you how I reinforce the steaks on the sewing machine and also my variation on Kate Davies steak sandwich so after the, the front trimmings were done the next thing I had to do were the tucks around the neck so here's a picture and you might remember that I was talking about changing the sizes of each individual tuck. Well, I did do that. It's only a very subtle difference, but each tuck has a couple of rows less than the one below. So the light blue tuck ended up being nearly half the size of the bottom gold tuck. So, but I think it looks really nice. It's kind of neat and it sits in, lies in um, snug against the neck. Also, you can see that I didn't start my tucks at the outside edge of the center front trimming. Instead, I started them on the inside of the trimming. And I think this is actually a mistake. 
So the pattern is kind of written in a Scandinavian style of fairly minimal instructions and it didn't say whether I should start the, the neck edge opening right at the edge or a little bit in. And I couldn't see in the picture what they were doing so I ended up doing mine here which I think is wrong but I think it still looks good. So And there's a lot of work in these tucks so I'm just leaving it the yeah, way it is. I think it would be good either way. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Now the other thing is you might remember the crazy shaping I did on the bodice because I was really concerned that my bust wasn't big enough and I wouldn't get this gape that's meant to happen right around the widest part of the chest. So, and this garment is based on a traditional wed uh, wedding garment and I really wanted that traditional kind of bodice corset shaping. look. Yeah. Shaping, yeah. So here's a picture and you can see that the top arrow, just below the start of the armhole shaping, I decreased back in there to make the bodice narrower. I really didn't think this through properly because I decreased both on the front at the side seams and the back at the side seams. Now that was a really stupid thing to do because of course I want my back width to say the same. I want to be able to move like this. I only want to pull this section back. So I should have only done decreases at the side seam on the front parts here. Yeah, so, you don't have the same curves. No, I mean, of course you want the, the full width across the, the, the widest part of your back. But I didn't notice this until the whole thing had been cut open, trimming had been done, and a lot of work had been done on it. So I was really kicking myself. If I'd been a better sewer, I would really have picked this up immediately. Now, you might know, I'm sure many of you do know, the Vullenwein yarn dyer, Kristen. And Kristen, as you will also know, loves a little bit of the gothic look and I know that she really loves this design and she's been considering knitting it for herself. Well Kristen if you're watching this let me tell you that for a few days after I cut open the steaks I really seriously considered just finishing it off and giving it to you because I've met Kristen in real life and she's a little smaller than I am and she's more petite and I thought this garment is just going to probably fit her perfectly and I shouldn't mess around with it anymore so that at least it looks good on one person. <laughs> it's not going to look good on me. So that was, I was seriously considering doing that but in the end, because I was really kicking myself, I thought look I'll just try hard blocking it and I'm normally really not an advocate of hard blocking anything for fitting issues because it will distort the fabric and it'll distort the stitches, particularly on stranded colour work. It doesn't make the fabric look good. And because wool has memory, slowly the fabric is going to shrink a little bit back to where it wants to be. And the other thing is every time you wash the garment, you have to pin it out exactly to the dimensions that you want it and that's such a pain you can't just wash it and leave it yeah, flat that to sounds dry terrible. yeah but nevertheless i have done this because i've put so much work into this so i am keeping it <laughs> so here we go now the next thing is these clasps now crystal in her design has five clasps she has three really quite ornate ones down here and two up here they're hard to find and I couldn't find any that really look good with a garment that fitted colour-wise and size-wise. But I quite like these. These are sort of old gold looking but because they're small I've put four down here. And I'm meant to have two here as well. But I actually like the look now of the line just going like this and around and then straight up. And you like it too, don't yep. you? Yep. So I think I might actually just leave that and just have it sitting flat like this. And it's also the reason why if I pull it like that, it's going to pull a bit more. And that's partly because of my ill-fitting issues. <laughs> okay. Now the final thing is, oh, and then of course I put the sleeves in and I did this modification by putting tucks here to match the tucks around the waist and around the neckline and I'm really thrilled with that. I think that looks really good and matches. The final thing which I haven't finished yet is this insert and this little insert here sits, it's meant to sit in here. If you can imagine this and that's going to go across like that there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little edging on it, a gold edging on it like this here so that I can have my, because normally the, the garment's meant to shut like that. So you just see it like so this. So you don't see the top. Yeah, so you don't see the top. Okay. But because you will see the top, I'm thinking I'll do a little edging like this in gold running across here 
and mine will end up sitting, if I can just chuck some knitting needles around, it'll sort of sit like that. Yep. And I, I think that's pretty cool. Yep. So it's been such an adventure knitting this garment and it's been a lot of fun. I like to knit unusual things and um, learn some different things and just be able to play around on them. So it's been great. I'm really happy with it. I know it's an out there looking kind of a garment to wear, but I think it still just would look fine with jeans. I've got it on with dark blue jeans or like a jean skirt or any kind of skirt. I yeah. think you can kind of play the effect down a little bit. Yeah, I think it's fine to wear out. Yeah. Maybe our perspective is changing a bit. But. <laughs> This garment is a design by Crystal Seyfarth. It's called the Morning Star Bridal Jacket. It's been knitted bottom up in the round with steaking stitches going up the center opening and also at the armholes here. So once I got up to the front neck shaping, I cast off all the middle stitches, including the steaking stitches, and then I just worked back and forth, knitting and purling to shape the front and back neck curves and also the decreases for the shoulder shaping. So in this tutorial, I'm going to show you how I complete the finishing on the centre front opening and the neck of this jacket. First, I'll reinforce my steaks on the sewing machine, then I'll cut them open. And finally, I'll pick up the stitches and knit the trimming that goes down the centre front opening and the tucks that go around the neck edge. So it's much easier to manoeuvre the sewing machine into the bodice and down the steaks before the shoulder seams are actually joined together. So I'll sew them up at the end. And if you haven't ever sewn a steak on a sewing machine, if you want to gain some confidence, just first practice on your original knitted swatch. So this is the front opening. I've got 10 steaking stitches and two edge stitches on either side of the steaking stitches. And first of all, I'm going to use a long straight stitch right down the middle of this column of edge stitches right down there and I'm going to keep the sewing stitch really long so that the knitted fabric keeps as much elasticity as possible. The next thing I'm going to do is use a zigzag stitch set to a medium length and as wide as possible and I'll sew this zigzag stitch slightly further away from the edge so that it catches the outside legs of two different columns. So it's going to take, it's going to go over the right leg of this column and the left leg of the stitch in that column. So it's going to join two columns together just zigzagging all the way down. I've sewn over the sticking stitches twice now, once with a long straight stitch and once with a wide zigzag stitch and the fabric's really secure and nothing is going to unravel. So the next step is to cut up the middle of the steak. Make sure you've got your hand underneath the steak where you're cutting so you're not accidentally cutting two fabrics at once, you're not cutting through your back fabric. So later I'm going to trim it down even further to only about two or three stitches wide but before I do that I want to pick up the stitches along the front opening and knit the trimming. So you can see that I've now completed the knitted band on one side of the front opening. This jacket doesn't have buttonholes, instead it's going to have traditional looking metal clasps that'll just join the two sides together. So this is what it looks like on the inside and I'm really happy with how it's turned out, I think it looks really neat. What I've done is a slight variation on a great technique that Kate Davies developed and called the Steak Sandwich. So you can read all about this technique on her blog. So now I'm going to show you what I did on the other side. Here are my steak stitches which haven't yet been trimmed back and you can see the row of sewing machine stitches going down on the very edge of the steak. So this column here, along here, that is now part of the real garment and I'm going to pick up my front band stitches in between the first two columns of stitches on the actual real garment. So right in between there, along there. So I'm going to start with the right side facing me and my front band openings are going to be knitted in stocking stitch, not rib. You can see that there. So I'll need less stitches than if I was going to knit a ribbed band because rib always pulls together and has negative ease. 
So I want to pick up about 15 stitches for every 10 centimeters and that means I'll be picking up stitches in roughly three out of four rows plus a couple of extra stitches at the top and the bottom corners and that's just to make it make sure that the corners lie flat. You can see here how flat and square that looks so it's not pulling in towards that way or it's not there's not too many and it's puckering out here it's just lying pretty well square and same at the, at the neck edge. So there's the first column of knit stitches and the second column of knit stitches and I'm going to put my needle, the point of my needle, down in between the stitch, wrap it with yarn, bring it back up and I'll do that for three consecutive stitches and then I'll miss one and do another three. I've knitted nine rows of stocking stitch ending with the right side facing me so that I'm ready to start with another knit row. And now I'm going to turn it over to the wrong side and there's my steek again, I still haven't cut it back. And if you have a look right at the back, for every stitch that I picked up on the right hand side you can see a little loop or a little stitch on the back side here. So now I'm going to get a thinner needle because it's much easier to work with a thinner needle and I'm going to put each one of those little loops on the second needle. And I've just started to do it there so you can see what that looks like. So as Kate Davies explains, this is a really great technique because you don't have to worry about picking up the exact same number of stitches as you had on the front and you don't need to worry about spacing the stitches out evenly in the same way that you did on the front and that's because you're actually picking up the very same stitch. All the little stitches on the back have been picked up so it's time for me now to trim back my steek and I'm going to do it to one uh, stitch or column on the other side of where my sewing machine stitches were. So there they are there and I'll cut back to here. So the final step is just to do a three needle bind off. So this little bit of knitted stocking stitch is going to curl over the top like that and then I'm going to do a three needle bind off between the two stitches. So there it is, it's all finished. You can see how neat it is. That's just the, the three needle bind off, that row of stitches on the surface. I love the way it looks. I think it's so neat and um, tidy, yeah. Okay, so either end you'll end up having uh, a tail and you can use that tail just to, to neaten it up and sew the ends shut. That's both front bands completed. They look great. The next step is to pick up stitches around the neckline and knit three tucks that'll match the tucks around the waistline. <laughs>
The scenery around Eshenes is really spectacular. We would have loved to have put the drone up there, but it was just so windy. We actually sat down for a picnic lunch and we were lucky that the lunch didn't blow away. It was so windy. But um, yeah, you saw the lighthouse at the end there. I was really interested in the lighthouse, so I did do a little bit of research. It was built in 1929 by a man called David Allen Stevenson. And it turns out that he's part of this amazing family of Scottish lighthouse yeah. engineers. So there was David Allen Stevenson. Then there was his brother, Charles, and his nephew, who was also called David Allen Stevenson. He died in 1971, and he was sort of the end of the Stevenson line of Scottish lighthouse engineers. Years. But if you go backwards in time, you'll see that David Allen's father and his uncles and his great grandfather and his great grandfather were all lighthouse engineers in Scotland. Now, the great grandfather, whose name was Thomas Smith, he's a really interesting character. He was born in 1752 and he started his working career designing and building street lamps for the city of Edinburgh. In 1786, he was appointed the very first engineer for the Northern Lighthouse Board, which is responsible for all of the lighthouses in Scotland. And if you which, think of Scotland's raggedy coast... It's pretty important, and he was yeah. there right at the beginning of all of that. Yeah. Um, so Thomas Smith and all of the Stevensons, they all brought these really important innovations into Scottish lighthouse construction. And one of the very first of these is actually the revolving light, which was a new idea back in the 18th century. And the thing about a revolving light is that it means that a sailor sees a regular flash of light rather than just seeing a constant light. And the frequency of this flash can help the sailor recognize which light he's actually looking at. So if you think around Shetland, if you see a flash of light every 10 seconds, then you know you're looking at Eshenes Lighthouse, which yeah. is on the, the west coast of Shetland. If you see a flash every 30 seconds, you know you're looking at Sumbra Head Lighthouse, which is right down the southern tip. So this was a really important concept, and the Stevensons developed that inside of Scotland over the years to include the use of colour and also different mechanisms to give different flashing patterns so that every lighthouse had its own individual signature. Yeah. That's pretty cool. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. And another innovation that they brought again into Scotland was the Fresnel lens. Now, the Fresnel lens is really important because it lets you build a lens which is smaller and also much thinner than a conventional lens would have to be. You can see in this picture here. Um, and it's also extremely efficient at concentrating light, which meant that the lighthouses could be seen from much greater distances, probably also better in fog is also yeah, an issue. Yeah. Uh, this remained the standard technology for lighthouse lenses right up into the 20th century. And it was so important as a technology that it's been called the invention that saved a million ships. How cool. Pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. And there's actually one more connection, there's, isn't there? There's one other interesting thing immediately. A literary. About, about, yeah, a literary <laughs> connection with the Stevensons and lighthouses. There's a lighthouse called Muckle Flugger Lighthouse, which is right up the northern tip of Shetland. And it's actually, you've got Unst, it's the top island, the northernmost island, and then there's this rocky outcrop a little bit north of that. And that's where this Muckle Flugger Lighthouse is. That was built by David and Thomas Stevenson. Now, what year? 1854. Okay. Was. Now, Thomas Stevenson's son is Robert Louis Stevenson, who is the writer, and he's the writer of of Treasure Island. The famous 18, Treasure Island. 1883, yeah. yeah. And uh, apparently Robert Louis Stevenson visited Unst to see the lighthouse that his father had built. And the story is that Unst has been the inspiration for the map of Treasure Island that Robert Louis Stevenson included in the novel, which I can actually remember seeing in my dad's copy of that book yeah. when I was a little Me kid. Me too. Me ages too. Ago. I can remember how fascinating it was. Yeah. yeah. So... <laughs> 
Yeah, Robert Louis Stevenson, not a lighthouse builder, but nevertheless, it's in there. That's an amazing story. <laughs> yeah. And just the, the whole family, the clan of lighthouse builders. Yeah, yeah. Extraordinary. So many generations. Okay, you better show us your sock. Yeah, my sock. So this, this probably would reasonably come under what's your excuse, our, our occasional <laughs> segment, what's your excuse, because there hasn't been much progress and really we have been very busy. We've been driving over here and then preparing in all sorts of different ways to come here. So there hasn't been much progress. I have got a heel. I don't think we had a heel last time. No. We had a little bit of progress on the foot, but there's not. Yeah. But I am aiming to have this ready and walking up Snowdon. Yeah, they're for you. Very soon. They are for me. So they're the same pattern and wool as what Andrew knitted for me. It's a yep. solitude wool. Yep. yep. Dorset hike yarn. Yeah. There we go. Great. Good on you. So it's now time to announce the three winners for the Woodhouse Knits Carl, which ended on the 30th of November. So Jennifer Wood is donating one of her own patterns to each of the first two winners so they can pick a pattern of their choice from Jennifer's designs. And we're donating the third prize, which is a, any choice of pattern from Ravelry whatsoever. <laughs> so any pattern you want, garment, blanket, accessory from any designer. Great. Okay. Now the rules for this car were you could pick any pattern whatsoever from jo from Jennifer Wood and mainly garments were entered, but there was also some beautiful shawls and a hat. And I think in the end, there was 37 projects finished. So congratulations to all of you. And a couple of people even entered multiple times with two or three finished garments. So that's really spectacular. That's and amazing. A, a special congratulations to you if you were one of those people. That's fantastic. Okay, so now I'm going to announce the first two winners. And once you've been announced, you can go and check out Jennifer's patterns again and pick one. And then you can personal message Jennifer Wood on Ravelry with the pattern of your choice and she will gift it to you. So here goes. The first winner is entry number four, whose Ravelry name is Dora Blue, and Dora knitted Dandelion Wish. So the little flowers on this design are worked by stranding the second colour behind, just like stranded knitting. And Dora has done her flowers in a gentle purple gradient with a couple of bright red flowers thrown in for a pop of colour. I think the effect is really spring-like and looks fantastic. So well done, Dora. The second winner is entry number 16, whose Ravelry name is Becky Senko Knits. And she knitted Muron, which is also one of my favourite designs from Jennifer. And I think it looks great in that gold colour. Congratulations, Becky. Key. The third winner is entry number 35, and that's Inga Ann, whose Ravelry name is I Ann 3. So Inga Ann knitted Starry for her daughter Mary Ann. Now, this is a really beautiful photo. The jumper looks fantastic, fits Mary Ann really well, and the snowy background just looks so festive. So well done. So, Inga, we're donating your prize. You can pick any design that you wish from any designer on Ravelry, and we'll gift it to you. So, could you please personal message me on Ravelry? with a link to the pattern that you would like and I'll buy it for you. So there's only three winners. There can only ever be a certain amount of winners and it's usually a very small amount, but there's always so many great projects. And so I like to just show a couple more off to give them a little bit of Honourable a boost. Honourable mentions. Honourable mentions, a little bit of fame because they everyone yep. deserves that. This project here is by Heather, whose Ravelry name is Lace Wing on Heather, and she knitted three jumpers and one hat for this carl, which is really amazing and definitely needs a mention. So the one on the left is Remy, the one on the right is Murray, and this one is Estelle, and I think they all look fantastic, so well done, Heather. Now this project here is by Jill, who's Jilly MG, and she finished just in the nick of time. So Jill has knitted Victoria, and I really love the soft grey gradient that she's used. It's very gentle, and you can still clearly see the lace on the hem. So well done, Jill. And this is a second cropped sleeve short version of Remy by Pearls and Lace. I think that also looks fantastic and needs to be shown off. So thank you to everybody who joined in the Carl, who chatted away, who encouraged other people and gave advice. That's just as important in one way because yep. it keeps people's morale going and it makes it fun for everybody, which is really what it's all about. A special congratulations to everybody who finished their projects and also to the three winners. So many of you now have just got either a new shawl or a new garment or a few new garments to wear over Christmas and New Year's, which I think you'll really enjoy doing, and that's fantastic. 
So obviously I need to think of a new Carl, don't I? Yep. And I've got a few ideas, so I'll mull them over and hopefully we'll announce them in the next episode. But right now it's time for Knitters of the World and we're going to see the Taiwanese designer, Irene Lin. I'm a knitter from Taiwan. I first learned to knit when I was in secondary school, during home economic classes. I made a simple scarf for myself and fell in love with knitting since then. However, I didn't spend too much time knitting through. I studied law for my undergraduate degree and became a flight attendant after graduation. For six years, I fly around the world and visited more than 25 cities in dozens of countries. Because of my job, I had the opportunity to enjoy beautiful things in different places. I have been inspired by various cultures. After getting married, I became a full-time housewife, so finally I had time to pick up knitting again. In Taiwan, most knitting tutorials and patterns are from Japan. I myself study a lot of Japanese knitting books, and I always like to twist the patterns a bit here and there, and I always change something to make it suit me better. So in the end, I started to make my own designs. Three years ago, I published a knitting pattern book in Taiwan. It includes several hats and scarf patterns. Later, I began to publish patterns on Ravelry. So let me introduce some popular designs for you. First, the boho style mosaic shawl and cardigan. I like the technique slip stitch very much. Compared with trendy color work, it is very simple to work. You only use one color at a time and you don't have to worry about the catching flows. I choose earthy colors to design the shawl and using slip stitch to create the boho style patterns and complete the style by adding tassels. Then I design a cardigan with the same pattern. It is a very simple regular cardigan with pickup color in garter stitch. The highlight is the loop stitch at the edge. It is added by crocheting. Personally, I really like the edge because they are very eye catching. I always want to have a fully cable outfit, so I designed this cable cardigan. It also has a very simple regular structure. You start from the back neck and work the front band together from top down seamlessly. The cable design is a bit different from others. I use garter stitch in between, so when you are working at the wrong side, you can curl across all stitches. This makes cables much easier to work. This cable cardigan is my gold piece. It goes with casual jeans or an elegant skirt. The symbol is in beige because I want to show the cables clearly, but I think it would look great in dark colors too. In Taiwan, we can only wear wool for two or three months a year. So summer tops are more practical than sweaters. The design begins with the wrap. You start from the back neck and work some lace for the shoulder from top down seamlessly. You separate the front and the back to make the armholes and join again to work flat until your desired length. The summer top also starts from the back neck, working top down seamlessly. You separate the front and the back to make the armholes and then join again to work in the round until your desired length. My most recent design is a collaboration with Lovecraft, featuring yarns from the Young Collective. The bright show is a classic triangle show. The first section is done with twisted and cross stitch. It creates delicate cables look like braid. The middle section is a color work with slip stitch. The border section is twisted ribbon with knot stitch in the middle. 
They look like a row of ribbons or a bit like fancy curtains. I choose earthy colorways for this show so it can go with any outfit. And tassels always make everything better. This is rainbow jumper. It also begins from back neck, working top down seamlessly. And then you pick up stitches to work the neckline. The highlight of this jumper is definitely the sleeves. With the bare shape and the color work. When I'm designing clothes, I will only emphasize one feature. For example, this jumper is mainly knitted with stuck neck stitch. And this is because I want to get your attention to the sleeve. But in order to make the knitting progress a bit more interesting, I also added a little twist around the neckline and the hem, so the knitters won't feel bored with endless stuck neck stitch. Thank you so much Andrea and Andrew for having me. I really enjoy this. Knitting always brings me peace and joy. I live in Taipei, Taiwan, which is a busy city, but we also have beautiful natural scenery. If the weather is good, I will knit outdoor while enjoying the sun and the fresh air. Let's go outside and take a look. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed meeting Irene Lin and also getting a glimpse of Taipei with that amazing skyscraper. It's 508 meters tall. It was the tallest building in the world until 2010 when Dubai built something that's even taller. Okay, so back to Irene. I think she's a very talented and stylish designer. I really liked the loops that she mm -hmm. did on the crochet loops on, on her cuffs and hems of that boho cardigan or jacket. And also the garter stitch as a background to cables on the cable cardigan is a really good idea. It's fantastic for just less experienced knitters. It yeah, helps them. I, I think Irene's got a few tips like that for well, at least making things simpler. Yeah, yep. finding the easy way to do things. Yep. And if you're living in a warm climate, I suggest that you start just watching these Asian designers like Irene because often – they're designing very fashionable, stylish garments for warm climates. And, the, and if you're allergic to wool as well, they're often using blends of cotton or silk or bamboo. So it's a good idea to keep your eye on them and that'll give you more choices of, of what kinds of garments or knitwear if you're wanting to wear things more, I think. Because we do have people asking us, what can yep. I wear in a warm climate? Definitely, yeah. yep. Now, Fruity Knitting patrons, Irene is kindly offering you a 25% discount on all of her self-published designs. Today, Irene showed us some garments and a shawl, but she has plenty more garments in her Ravelry store, including more lightweight, summery tops, but she also has some great hat designs. So enjoy looking through her collection, and thank you to Irene. Now, as we said, we've been traveling for four days doing a series of interviews on our way over to Snowdonia here in Wales for our Christmas break. So we thought we'd show you just a tiny bit of footage to see what we've been up to. First, we drove north from Frankfurt to Amsterdam. And Amsterdam has amazing facilities for bike riders. They have clearly separated paths for bikes all over the city. We thought Germany did this really well, but Amsterdam does this exceptionally well. And as you can see at this train station, Everybody in Amsterdam has a bike. There are much more beautiful scenes of the city centre, but we really were on a tight time schedule, so we just didn't do any sightseeing this trip. 
but here's Andrew taking the equipment to our very first interview. And when that interview was done, we then drove down to Calais to take the Eurotunnel from France across to the UK. Now, the most nerve-wracking thing for us here is to make sure that our dog Jack gets through customs properly because his passport has to all be in order with all of his injections properly recorded and signed by his vet. And Jack's chip has to be read. And as you can see, Jack always makes a big fuss about this. And if we can't find that chip and read it, we're not allowed to cross into the UK with Jack. But we got through all of customs and here we are driving down the platform onto the train which goes under the sea to Dover. So there's two stories on the train and we're driving up to the top story and we have to drive right down the end of the train and when each carriage is full these big doors that we're driving through will close. The trip is 50 kilometres and it takes about 30 minutes and you're encouraged to stay in your car for the whole trip. And we're travelling 75 metres below the seabed and 115 metres below the sea level. So it's really best not to think about it. Now, after a couple of days and in interviews in the south of England, we finally headed up to North Wales. And here the, the scenery just slowly becomes more magical. There's more beautiful stone houses. The fields are full of sheep and we just start to breathe and relax. So we really wish to thank all of the wonderful viewers who have become Fruity Knitting patrons and supported the show. This show would not be here without you. You are very, very important. Thank you so much. <laughs> And uh, it is Andrew's full-time job and my full-time job. And as we've said, every episode, we need patrons for this show to continue. So if you are watching regularly, please do contribute a small amount every month to make sure that this show can continue. So thank you. Now, this is our one annual holiday over Christmas, which we always take over Christmas. And for the last few years, it's been in Wales. Now, we have been working on the way over here and we do have more interviews to do on the way back. But we are taking one definite week off doing nothing else but hiking and spending time with our daughter who's due to come over here. So we are going to do no work for one week, which is going to be brilliant. But that does mean the next episode's coming out in three weeks and not two weeks' time. But we will look forward to seeing you there. Christmas is coming up. That's in one week. And New Year, we wish all of you a wonderful, wonderful time with your family and friends. Safe travels everywhere. And look forward to having a great year next year. We're going to have a great year next year. We're going to bring out lots of great, exciting, informative episodes for you. <laughs> Coming up now is our interview with Joanna Hunter, which is going to be really interesting. Joanna is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a discount on everything in her online store. So check that out. And a big thanks to Joanna. So, okay. See you in 2020. Yeah. Thanks for being with us. Bye. Bye. Knitting. I'm here with Joanna Hunter in her knitwear design studio in Larrick in Shetland. And Joanna's family goes back many, many generations in Shetland. And Joanna herself grew up here and she completed her studies in textiles at the local university. Now she has a knitwear brand, Joanna Hunter, that's inspired by traditional feral knitting and it's completely produced here in Shetland. And during the Shetland Wool Week, her studio is open to the public and she also teaches workshops on developing mood boards and playing with colour. And some of those ideas she's going to share with us today in the interview, which I'm really looking forward to. So welcome to Fruity Knitting. Thanks for agreeing to be on the <laughs> Thank show. you for having me. <laughs> Good. So like I said, your family goes back many, many generations in Shetland. So tell us a bit about your family background as it relates to knitting. And then tell us how your brand, Joanna Hunter, and your shop, Ninian, got started. 
Yeah, well, my family goes back at least eight generations on both sides, uh, probably further, but that's as far as we've got. And uh, they were all fishermen, all the ladies knitted and crofters. Yeah. So knitting's always been one of the main parts of uh, how they made an income. So I have a family collection of textiles here that I thought might interest you. Um, and we're starting here right with this little piece that was uh, my mother's. It was knitted by her mother. And uh, you can see it was her little undergarment and it's so beautiful and tiny. Um, they always had the wee bit of lace trim on the bottom. And of course it was predominantly for warmth. And did the children ever complain that it was scratchy? Always. Always. <laughs> that was part of growing up in Shetland. I think so, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, but I mean, it was primarily to primarily keep them warm uh, under their dresses. Yeah. But yeah, it wouldn't have been very comfortable, I do think, to wear. And who wore, would have worn that in your family? So this was my mother's. Mm -hmm. It was made by her mother. And uh, yeah, I suspect I had it on at some point. My mother seemed to think so, but I cannot remember it. So Okay. Yeah. And these uh, look very gorgeous. <laughs> Tell us a bit about those. <laughs> so this one here again was made by my mother's grandmother and she was uh, big on embroidery so you can see that she embellished the whole front of this here but there's beautiful little roses and everything it's just so yeah. unique yeah. Um, with a little point on it it was uh, beautiful but again there's no fair aisle or anything on there so it's kind of a bit different it would have just had a wee button under the chin yeah so that's quite big that's probably worn by a a four, five-year-old. Yeah, I suspect yeah. so. We did think we had some photos, but unfortunately, I couldn't have found that one for you today. <laughs> <laughs> and this one here was mine, uh, and my mother knitted this one for me. You can see that lovely '80s colours yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can remember having that on my head and not being too comfortable in it. <laughs> Um, but I think that I wore as well these little mittens, which were my mother's, again knitted by her grandmother, uh, and I can remember me wearing them as well. Yeah, they're uh, stunning. That's gorgeous. That <laughs> and what about this? This is looking quite vintage here. Yeah, so this was knitted by my father's mother. She was a huge influence on me. Um, and this was knitted in the 40s uh, for a special occasion. It was for a wedding. Uh, and I can remember her wearing it right up to her 80s uh, whenever she had a fancy event to go to. Yeah. And uh, I've actually worn it as well for a few occasions. It's just such a beautiful kind of timeless piece, I think. Yeah. This isn't hand spun. This is a, a machine spun Yes, yarn, it will it? be, yeah. yeah. I don't think my family didn't seem to be big spinners. They were more, more the knitters. Okay, yeah. and is that a one ply? Do you think just a, it's a it's, lace yarn, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's a one ply. Um, I'm not sure where it would have come from at the time, uh, but she was an amazing lace knitter. So we yeah. have a huge collection of lace that's come through the family. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And this looks like a little child's fair old jumper. Yeah, so this was knitted, I think, for my father uh, by my grandmother again. Uh, and I can remember wearing this and absolutely detesting it. Uh, it was so scratchy and, yeah, I thought the patterns were just awful. Um, <laughs> and I suspect it was just knitted with whatever yarn was left lying around. Uh, yeah, at the time, again, hated it. But looking back, it's actually quite quirky. And it is. Lovely. It's cute in a <laughs> retro way. Yeah, and I actually, uh, my children have worn this one as well. So, and my brother's children. So, yeah, it's been been down through quite a few yeah. few generations. And I suppose have you re had to repair the ribbing or the cuffs or there's been there was a bit on the cuff somewhere. I think it's been so beautifully done you can't actually see. I can remember my granny uh doing that before my brother's yeah. children wore it. But, yeah. Okay, and this one was also done by your grandmother. Is this the grandmother who influenced you a lot? Or? So, yeah, so both grandmothers really influenced me massively in my choice to, to study textiles. But uh, my father's mother, um, she was a bit of a designer in her own right, really. Yeah. Uh, she always was thinking of kind of different styles and shapings and taking traditional patterns and turning them into something just a bit unusual, yeah. really. Yeah. And as much as I probably would never really wear this <laughs> collar here it was at the time it was kind of quirky it's gorgeous and, yeah she always had different ideas of things that she could put together and yeah. and changing and kind of 
yeah, reinventing slightly some yeah. of the old classics. It's really beautiful. Okay, so you started your business in a room in your parents' house, I think in 1999. That's correct, yeah. yeah. So this is my 20th year in business. And uh, after I finished studying, I decided that I wanted to start a business doing contemporary Shetland knitwear. Because as I said, I always thought the knitwear was extremely stale and awful that I had to wear as a child. Again, looking back, it's beautiful. Um, so I kind of looked at the textiles from a bit of a seamstress angle. So a lot of my garments has shapings mm -hmm. uh, and they kind of have different structures in them. So that was the idea when I started. Um, and you also, um, didn't you aim your marketing towards the Japanese market yeah. to start off with? So initially everything I did was really exported. We didn't sell a huge amount here um, and it was all quite garish. Um, we did some work, most of it was in Japan, America, Scandinavia. Um, and it was, yeah, tailored for a, to, to deliberately look different to the rest of the knitwear that was on offer. Yeah, okay. And then you had a, you had a stint in, in Coventry, didn't you? It was Covent Garden Covent in London, Gardens. yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, in 2003, I opened the shop mm -hmm. in the end. The idea was that I would get design laid products to complement my knitwear. Mm -hmm. Uh so that's how Ninian was born. And then uh, a few years later, I opened a stall in Covent Garden in London. Uh, and that was like a maker's market where you had to design and produce your own products, which was fabulous. So I kind of had the two things on the go. Mm. It was all quite stressful. Yeah. Um, and I was still wholesaling. And then... Uh, so you were commuting sort of between Shetland and London. Yes. Yeah. So I would do two weeks in London and two weeks in Shetland. Yeah. And the two weeks I wasn't in London, we had staffed it that ran the stall there and obviously the same here. Um, but there was kind of no no break. And if I wasn't doing that, I was away at trade fair selling knitwear or at uh, retail shows all over the mm -hmm. country. Um, and then I decided to have children. And when that happened, it all became a bit too much. Yeah. So we decided to start and try and scale it back a little. So who's your main market now? Is it is it the tourist industry or is it the local people? Um, it's really local, to be honest with you. Um, we do with the shop now. It never stops in Shetland. We never have a quiet month, really. Mm. Um, with the website as well, we're shipping all over the world. But the locals is is really the mainstay of the business. Okay. Um, I think they appreciate the work that goes into it. They appreciate the design. The design. Yeah. Um, and they're quite supportive. They've always been extremely supportive of the business. That's great. So like Joanna said, Ninian is in, or her brand, Joanna Hunter, is celebrating its 20th anniversary. So congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> could you show us or could you describe what your design aesthetic is now and also how it's evolved over the last 20 years? Yes. So I'll tell you how I got started. So this actually was one of the first pieces that... I kind of became known for. And when I was at studying at college, uh, the yarn company Hunters of Brora at the time sponsored a competition for design. And the brief was winter sportswear. <laughs> so I thought, oh, this would be great for skiing, of course. It was the obvious choice. And you can see from here, it's it's kind of loosely based on uh, what in my head, was a traditional fair yeah. Um The middle section here was felted, so each part of the garment was made separately. So the bottom bit here was knitted on the domestic machine. These sections here were all hand-woven in, and then it was sewn into a felted section here. And again, the top piece was knitted separately again. Very complicated to construct Beautiful. at the time yeah. and then the sleeves was knitted down but again knitted so far with a felted section and then the bottom bit sewn on so the idea was that I wanted to have different textures yeah. and different kind of how would you say it well it was just a completely different design yeah. idea yeah. and we had this uh, bear in mind this 22 years old it's it's maybe 
It's maybe seen better days, but we had this open sides with the toggles and yeah, just something completely different with the idea. What it had, is, had and it's really actually really, out. it's really beautiful and original. Thank you. Yeah, with the with the felting here. So yeah. you knitted everything and felted it. So it was just this this sections yeah. that sewn in here were knitted separately and felted, yeah. and these bits here weren't. Yeah. Okay. And again, it wasn't a using a Shetland yarn. It was using a really lightweight um, lamb's wool. And I knitted that on the domestic knitting machines. Okay, wow. Okay, so what's this then? So I kind of went on from there. We kind of used um, lots more of that kind of hand weaving ideas. And then I started looking at lace again. Um, this again is the cockle shell, a traditional pattern. But I thought, well, I could make this kind of really thin, fancy little bright coloured scarf. So it was taking something that was everybody knitted every day and just kind of revamping it slightly. Yeah, yeah. And this was one of the things we sold. This is hand knitted yeah. and we sold an awful lot of this uh, to the Japanese market at the time. Okay. But I couldn't keep up with finding hand knitters to help yeah, me make it. Yeah. So that's something we've moved completely away from over the years. Yeah, okay, wow. Now this looks like one of the very bright, colourful things <laughs> that you were aiming at the Japanese market to start yeah. off with, is that right? So this is one of the kind of classic designs we started with. However, we still actually make this and sell yeah. this in the shop yeah. now. Uh, and this is still one of the garish colours. <laughs> I quite like this clashing colours. And it was based on that very first designs that was made to go to Japan. And okay. here we are, 20 years later, yeah. still producing the And same still the, the shaping is still the same. Yeah, so this we actually knit on the industrial knitting machines. Mm -hmm. um, it's knitted on a 7-gauge knitted machine, and it's knitted out of 100% Scottish lambs wools. Okay. Um, and we knit the front panel, the back panel, and the sleeves, and then they're all can put together. Okay, so it's later. just for the viewers, it's, it's plain on the back. And lovely bright on the front, which is nice to have it plain on the back, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It means this can sort of show off, but not too much. Yeah, well, the idea when I came up with it was I thought, well, the younger market didn't really want to wear full feral at that time. And yeah. I thought, well, it's just introducing a little bit, but it's still quite a simple yeah. garment. Yeah, great. Okay, and what about this khaki number or <laughs> so. olive number? Yeah, so again, this is an extremely old one. And again, it was I was kind of looking at Celtic patterns as well as Fair Isle because mm -hmm. I didn't want to be constrained by just the one type of patterns. And we made these again for, um, actually for the National Trust of Scotland, we made this initial collection for, uh, and they had it in a lot of their locations there. We used um, organic Shetland yarn at the time from Jimison and Smith many moons ago and uh, yeah it was just kind of taking something that was with a tiny bit again of fair isle in it yeah but yeah. again still quite plain and the same this has the plain back on it okay so now we're up to the kind of designs that you're doing recently isn't it yeah so this one here this cardigan is again it's been quite a long stay for me um it's we've changed the the styling quite a lot but it was uh quite asymmetric Mm -hmm. You can see it has the shapings here for the waistline. Yeah. And again, on the back, the same. So it's quite tailored. Yeah. Uh, there's no pattern in it at all, completely plain, but I've made it quite obvious, all the shapings in there. So that's where the design feature is. And, of course, the buttonholes yeah. here. Um, and this, again, is made on a 7-gauge industrial knitting machine. Okay. And assembled here. But, yeah. And this one here has then since progressed into adding a little fair isle into that. So we kind of upped uh, this slightly, putting the fair isle here and adding trims on uh, and lengthening the sleeves on the first one, the plain one, that has the shorter length sleeves yeah. on it. And on this one, we have the full length sleeves. Okay. So it's the same initial really shape. Thank yeah. you. This is an extremely popular design. We've, uh, yeah, it just never seems to slow down. The selling of these ones. And this is just one of the very latest collections, is that this right? This is. We just launched this this week at Wool Week. And um, this is going back to quite a traditional fair isle. It was actually based around my father's cardigan from the 60s uh, that he wore as a student. Um, I kind of have gone through a phase of wearing my dad's jumpers yeah. when, I, when I was younger but I recently saw it again and thought this was I, I love the panels uh, so we kind of switched it up changed it into a 
different type of garment. We have a boat neck on here, just a little accent, uh, yeah. a pattern in there. And again, this is knitted on a seven gauge machine. It's got the bird's eye backing on it, so there's no floats on there. Yeah. And it's extremely kind of thick it and It is, warm. isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. People say that your garments are very well made or very high quality. What makes them high quality? <laughs> <laughs> well, everything we do, uh, everything's hand finished, obviously. We, we manufacture everything ourselves here. Um, and the idea is that because it's not mass produced, we can take the time over the garments to make sure that everything is as it should be. Mm -hmm. And we also offer a service uh, that quite a lot of local people use that will wash your garments for you. We can maintain your garments. And the idea is that I like to think that you just have that garment until you pass it on to the next generation. Yeah. So, um, yeah, keeping the quality high, we use high quality yarns and all the, the staff at work here are extremely well trained in what yeah. they do. Yeah, so... The fibres that you're using, it's it's all pure wool and lamb's wool, isn't it? Scottish yeah. lamb's wool? Yeah, so this is all Scottish lamb's wool. It's quite a light, it's 217s is the numerical count on it. It's quite a light, lighter weight um, and it washes extremely well. Everything we make, we make it at a kind of bigger stitch density mm -hmm. and then we shrink it in the washing machine just very slightly oh, okay. so that it's not going to change shape. Yeah. It does not, yeah, it's not going to shrink at all. So that's something that we spend a lot of time figuring out is to get the stitch to the right, right width. That's a really interesting <laughs> point that you would actually slightly shrink it a bit to keep it uh, longer lasting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so Joanna is actually going to show us the process that she uses to develop her designs from sketches and mood boards right through to the final garment. And I think you're going to show us an example um, based on your latest collection, aren't you? Yes, cool. that's right. So here's an example of how I design products. So this collection here actually started life uh, looking at the island where my grandmother was born, Hefra. And then at that point, I actually had a life-changing illness. Uh, and it, I kind of spent a year sitting at home looking at this hill in Shetland. And I started thinking about it, and the hill leads down towards the island. And so I started looking at the maps. And this has progressed on to looking at how I could simplify maps, how I could simplify outlines of uh, um, headlands and islands and this has progressed on to being this snood here and as you okay. can see I've just kind of digitally worked um, loosely based around the Ordnance Survey maps looking down the contours um, but using just very bright bold accent mm. colours so we've done one long snood here mm -hmm. and then we've also brought the same design work but uh, made it slightly smaller simplified yeah. it into a tight snood and using this accent colours here has then brought me onto this collection which is back to my natural um feral yeah so this again is just working with the two colors so it's simplified but yeah. again having this bright bold accent yeah. color which gives you a really interesting backing on the on the bird's eye backing here in the fair isle it does it's beautiful and from there then i went uh onto the full garment <laughs> so this was the kind of big boxy chunky chumpy jumper here um which yeah it's just nice to add the, the colour back into it at this point and to, uh, yeah, play around with the colour and see where we can get to. And this is even more colourful. This is even more colourful. This is the new cardigan that we've not quite finished yet, but it's the idea is it's like a big chunky jacket. It's quite heavy. Um, again, knitted out of lamb's wool. Uh, this should be in the shop, hopefully, for Christmas time, if we can get it finished. Um, and no fastings on it, I can see. No fastenings on here at all. It's just going to be quite a nice, warm, heavy coat yeah. cardigan. Type it's very thing. beautiful. But to get uh, the colour experimentation here, I tend to then go into the design software, which I have, so I can give you a quick demonstration of that. That would be brilliant. So here's an example of uh, one of our swatches that I've got on the computer here. And this gives me a really easy way to play with colours. So I can very quickly um, look at how the different colours is going to work together. We're just going to vary this at complete random. So as you can see, I can virtually knit all this quite quickly and see what does and doesn't work. Um, I can also knit the swatch here. There we go. We've got the texture on the background there. 
And from here, what I tend to do is usually send it across the knitting machine, the pattern, and then I'll physically knit the final swatches so as I can see exactly how they're going to look. We can then send it across to the knitting machine. Uh, this is something I don't use just too often. However, you can see here that it'll give you all the instructions on how to knit, when to change colour, uh, and what you need to do if you need to decrease, increase, you can knit a whole jumper using this software. Okay, so I teach uh, classes in mood boards and colour. Yeah. And traditionally, I would say that the people that come on my classes are people who's maybe slightly stuck with colour or people who are scared of colour. Um, the majority of them work in textiles, but they may be hand knitters, machine knitters, weavers, uh, everybody really yeah. this kind of applies to to anybody so how i start is i get them to choose an image an image they like not necessarily an image that uh is the colors they would like it's mm -hmm. more about finding something that sits comfortably with them and then from there i get them to make yarn wraps as you can see here we have five on this mood board mm -hmm. extracting every color that's in the picture and nine times out of ten, the people will miss the majority of the colours they don't like. So the white, for an example, is one that most people won't see. Um, you can see you're naturally drawn to this poppy bit in the mm -hmm. middle here, which we've got here. Um, however, the, the shading on her eyes, yeah. which is all these yellows, um, the accent down here, the teal in the bit of rope here, there's so many colours once you really allow your eyes to focus in on the image um, and that's where a lot of people get stuck in the beginning is they'll maybe pull out five colors yeah and i'll say to them well i can see over 20 colors in there maybe 30 40 and that's kind of takes us an hour i would say to extract the color alone mm -hmm. for the garments so then people arrange um their wraps all differently some people like to have spaces so they yeah. can see the colors better uh you can naturally break it down into slight palettes, but this is a personal choice that everybody has to deal with this in a different way uh, to allow themselves to start processing the colours. Yeah. And just quickly, what you said before is that sometimes you turn the picture around yeah. like this so that they're not stuck on, on the, the story of the picture and all they can't recognise it so easily yes. and then they can just look only at colours and yeah. that's a helpful thing. So once we've got all the colours out that yeah. they think is there, we then will either turn it upside down, look at it from a different angle, one way or another look at it yeah. from a different angle, and then you will see that there's far more pops of the colour coming out again. If you see pinks and blues here that we didn't see the other way around. Mm. And that'll allow you again to find that last few bits of colour. Yeah. And then from there, we tend to uh, then start thinking, okay, well, we don't necessarily need to think about an end product. We don't necessarily need to think how we're going to use this. Let's just try and put colours together yeah. that we've got on the palette. And I, at this point, I'll get them to start looking at tone, the depth, the weight of colour. So you can see here that if you were doing traditional shading or grading, these work beautifully, mm -hmm. but you're not going to see this one on top of that one. Yeah. Tonally, they're too, too similar. And just by adding these two flat colours into that palette, you get a complete pop. Yeah. And you can see here on the swatches we've made, on this one here, the background is a flat colour. Yeah. And all the grading and shading is in the pattern with, again, this pop running through the middle. And this is exactly the same colourway in exactly the same order, we've just changed that the pattern is now the flat colour and that the colours are changing in the background. Yeah. And again, if we look at this here, this is the same uh, pop in the middle, but by changing the colours that's sitting around it, it does change the colour again. Yeah. So it just helps you to kind of look at colour in a different way and see that by changing the colours you put together, um, how you can create different palettes. Yeah. Okay, so where do they get stuck most? When, where, do, where do you find that they just have a natural blockage? Well, most people are just drawn to use the colours that they think suits them mm -hmm. without maybe thinking, well, actually, um, I might not be making something for myself. Yeah. I might be making a pair of socks. I might be making a cushion. You don't always yeah. have to think uh, the end product yeah. when yeah. they start. But it, it is, your eye is just drawn to what you like and it's trying to 
let your brain work in a different way to find colours that you don't like. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you think the key issue is getting them out of their comfort zone of the colours that they like, not necessarily worrying about how to which colours don't go together. Yeah, I mean, always when we get to the stage that we're starting to build the five mm -hmm. colours together, we usually work with five just because I give them a pattern so that they can hand that to swatch or whatever machine, it, whatever they're going to do with it. Um, so we try and work with the five. I find that works quite well. But people do just say, well, wh what do I do now? How do I get past and that's the stage we start just pulling yarns together and looking at them um squinting your eye maybe using your phone on the mono setting to see mm. the tonal values in there uh, and by just allowing yourself to sit with that color for quite a while it, it does just break down how they see it yeah okay and what's your advice to people who are wanting to put a pop of color that's just a little bit agitating but still beautiful if you know what I mean yeah, well, I'm I'm the queen of the pop of colour, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I do love a pop of colour, but I think that people tend to think that they have to use, they're not allowed to use something that's completely garish and bright. And mm -hmm. actually, as you can see here, when you put it in, mm. it, it softens itself. Mm. So don't be scared to go for something completely over the top because just that one row or a couple of stitches of that can completely transform any pattern. Yeah, yeah. okay. And do you talk much about colour... Um, colour basics like if you see this yellow here it's super super warm and it's right next to this it's the same tone here really next to that soft pink but it's and it's quite clashy if you put both of them together but it works here again we can see the tonal values well I would say these two are quite tonally the same and the weight of the colour here is it's I would say it's the weight of the background okay. colour that's making the pop yeah. In the orange here, stand out. Okay, yeah. So from here, the final part of the class is that uh, we choose one of their palettes, and I usually try and have one colour in there they don't like, and we take that across to the computer that we've already seen, uh, and they can virtually knit the swatches and play around with the order of the colour, and nine times out of ten, they're like, wow, that colour does work. That sounds so much fun. <laughs> okay, now... I'd like to. I'd like you to talk a little bit about the production side of the process because your all your garments and accessories are machine knitted here and hand finished in the house. That's good. So maybe you could take us to one of the machines and show us a little bit about how that's done. Yeah, certainly. So I'm just going to give you a quick demonstration. Here's one of our snoods. Here we knit. Um, the smaller items, some of the accessories on these domestic machines. And I have the snood we have here already laid on. So this is one full snood ready to be linked. And we just run waste uh, yarn and cotton draw thread between them uh, so that we can knit them in a long row of various colours. And we also, as you can see here with the draw thread, so as I can pick up the stitches at both ends of the snoods to link together. And on this machine here we have a poncho, so we have already turned the hem on here, sorry. <laughs> um, so that's already been done again with the waist thread on there, and we'll knit that up at the end and leave the raw stitching and then turn that hem on the linker. And here's just the finished garment of that. But I'll quickly show you uh, the knitting machine here. So at the moment I have two colours tied up on the machine. I can do up to six, eight with the colour changers. I've also already transferred the pattern from the knitting machine, uh, from the computer, sorry, across to the knitting machine. And now as it's already laid on, we just need to rip the rolls. We can also use the motor on here to knit which means that I don't have to do the hard work. So this here is the Lincoln machine. Um, and this sews all the seams together. We put all the sleeves in on the garments. We go across the tops. Um, all where you would traditionally uh, use the periloper graft is what we do with this machine here. And as I showed you, we run these together on the knitting machine with the waist and then we draw the waist thread here and then from there each stitch is put on the linking machine stitch for stitch along the top here So 
So now I have waste at this end and this end. And all I need to do is push the foot pedal. And that's the seam on the top of the poncho now finished. And we can just pull off all the waste here. And all of our scraps here go uh, to be recycled into different products. So from here we hand finish all the garments. We then wash them, hang them up to dry. Then we steam press them, sew in the labels and they're ready to sell. Well, it's been really interesting, first of all, to hear your story, but also fascinating to see how, or behind the scenes of how a small knitwear company actually works. So thanks for sharing that. You're very welcome. It's been great. Now, before we finish, is there anything that's interesting or new on the horizon for you? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I've actually been doing a really interesting project. I've been working for a film. I can't tell you too much about it. Um, but it's a historic World War One drama. It's mm -hmm. been released at the end of the year. And we got a really cool project to produce in scarves and wrist warmers uh, to look like they had been produced hand-knitted. Obviously, that's no viable for yeah. the volumes we've done them in. Um, so I had to design um, a scarf and the wrist warmers that could be machine-knitted based on the Women's Institute uh, hand knits that were sent to the soldiers in World War One. Okay. So it's been quite a cool project and I wish I could tell you more but unfortunately I can't. Yeah. Is there any fair oil in them? Can you tell us No, that? it's all texture based okay. uh, and it's all quite muddy colours, um, lots of greens, greys, yeah. Because it's got to go with the army costume. It is indeed, yeah. How exciting. So when a period film comes out <laughs> and there's some <laughs> scarves flashing around. Yeah, you can't miss them, that's for sure. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that sounds really exciting. Well, it's been such a pleasure to have you on Fruity Knitting. Thank you. Thank you. Let's say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye. Bye.